Hello and welcome to Scripture Untangled, a podcast by the Canadian Bible Society. My name is Joanna LaFleur. I'm a friend of the Canadian Bible Society, and I'm going to be your guide for today's episode. Today we feature an interview with Archbishop Emeritus Thomas Cardinal Collins of the Archdiocese of Toronto, interviewed by Lorna Duick. Cardinal Thomas Christopher Collins was born and raised in Guelph, Ontario, where his father worked for the Guelph Mercury paper and his mother was a legal secretary. He considered himself being maybe a teacher or a lawyer, but was profoundly inspired by his grade 11 English teacher at the Catholic high school, who suggested he should consider the priesthood. And after many years of study, he was ordained to the priesthood in 1973. After his studies and ministry took him around the world and across Canada, in January 2007, he was installed as the Archbishop of Toronto. During his time thus far in Toronto, Cardinal Collins has served the Toronto, Ontario, and Global Church through various appointments and notary leadership roles. On January 6, 2012, the Holy Father, Pope Benedict, announced the appointment of Cardinal Collins to the College of the Cardinals. So please enjoy this conversation with this distinguished guest. His Eminence Thomas Cardinal Collins is one of only 16 people in all of Canadian history to be appointed by the Pope to serve at the College of Cardinals. Cardinal Collins has served as a priest in Canada for 50 years, celebrating his golden jubilee in that role in May of 2023. It's quite a journey for a teenager from Guelph, Ontario, who was inspired by his grade 11 teacher to consider the priesthood. His studies since then have taken him through multiple degrees in arts and theology, from St. Jerome College in Waterloo to Rome. Cardinal Collins served as Archbishop of Edmonton before being appointed Archbishop of Toronto, a role he served until 2023. And now he serves the papal office as Cardinal. Your Eminence, welcome to Scripture Untangled. Well, thank you very much. It's a great joy to be here. Well, and I should mention that aside from serving the papal office, you also serve now on the board of directors at the Canadian Bible Society, the originators of yes. Scripture Untangled. After all of those many duties, why join the Canadian Bible Society? Well, I think the Canadian Bible Society does wonderful work. And many, many, many years ago, when I was teaching at St. Peter's Seminary in London, I uh, would go down to the Bible Society bookstore down, down the street from the seminary. Uh, for about once a week, we had a little lunchtime Bible study. And I remember bringing a little bag of sandwiches and the Bible Society provided the coffee. So that was nice. And then I would go and we'd sit around the table and have a little Bible study together. I've been doing that for 40 or so years. Uh, but I, I think the Bible Society does great work and I'm glad to, and I, I'm glad to be part of it in this way. Now that I'm no longer, I no longer have responsibilities for um, the, the Archdiocese of Toronto. Uh, I'm glad to be able to, to join on the board of the Canadian Bible Society. You know, we we loved watching you uh, interact with the city of Toronto, Canada's largest city. What were some of the things that were heavy on your heart as you were Archbishop for the, the Diocese of Toronto? Well, I think well, there were many uh, struggles, many joys, obviously, but also difficulties. And I think the COVID experience was very, very difficult for everybody. I think of all the people who are isolated, people who are lonely. Um, I think the people who lost their, their jobs, you know, or lost their businesses. Um, and uh, so there was a lot of suffering in, during those years and a lot of spiritual suffering too. You know, people felt uh, very uh, isolated. And that's why I was very, uh, you know, happy that I know I can only speak for the Catholic Church. I don't, I'm sure the others as well, but certainly in our parishes, uh, the parishioners, the priests reached out to their, their to one another to help them. And I know uh, even this video stuff was helpful because uh, uh, for a period of over, over a year, I think it was, I celebrated Mass at 7.30 every morning in the cathedral. And it went out uh, live streamed around the world. We got people. I had like letters, emails from Italy and South America, <laughs> everything. And uh, that very, uh, it's not the Mass, it's not the same as being there, 
but it's uh, it helped, I think, somewhat. And, and that's true of many of our parishes. So that was a difficulty. I think I, I would say that there are a lot of things in our society these days which are, I think, problematic. There's a lot of loneliness, a lot of strange things relating to the human person, um, which I do not think are in the long term very fruitful. Uh, you know, a lot of people are very confused, I think. And uh, so that's difficult for anyone, I think particularly for a Christian. And in the arc of your role as Archbishop at the City of Toronto, you have seen the embrace of medical assistance in dying, euthanasia. We are killing yeah. each other. And it's, mm -hmm. it's shocking numbers. Over 30 a day are requesting yeah. this. And I, I'm sure it must be a great disappointment for watching the ethic of the sanctity of life shift so drastically mm -hmm. in, the, in the public. It's been very, very sad and tragic. And uh, I remember going to Ottawa in the early days uh, when uh, the, uh, there were, there's interesting how the Carter decision, the, there was cherry picking of extreme cases used to get the justices to change, essentially destroy the law protecting life. Uh, it was an emotional reaction really. And yet it had profound and horrible effects. It wasn't thought out. And uh, and then when I was testifying in Ottawa, they said, oh, no problem. Oh, it's extreme cases, extreme cases. This rarely will this happen. Don't worry. There are guards, there are protections, all kinds of protections. Again. Well, one after another, they've been ripped away. We're not at a slippery slope. We're well at the bottom of a slippery slope, and maybe we got more to go. And so I find that really troubling. But there was an illuminating moment. I forget the exact text, but... But uh, in those early days of this horrible thing, one of the documents, I forget it was a, as a preparatory document, said, what shall we call this? Euthanasia? That means happy death. It originally did. People want to hide what it is. It's not happy death. Uh, what shall we call it? Let's call it medical assistance in dying. That sounds better than what it is. So I take some small consolation in the conscience that yet remains, the people are embarrassed to call it lethal injection. They're embarrassed to call it that. And they therefore call it medical assistance in dying because it sounds good. When in anything we do in our life, I think a basic principle is if we have to cover it over with sweet and deceptive words, then we should wonder why are we doing what we're doing? Uh, you know, uh, if we call bank robbery a uh, you know, spontaneous withdrawal of funds from a financial institution rather than bank robbery. We say, why do you call it that? Why not call it what it is if you're proud of what you're doing? And so I find that it's an interesting dynamic. There is medical assistance in dying when people, I think of my sister, uh, Patricia, when she was dying, she had uh, pancreatic cancer. She was very, it's quite painful, very painful. And the nurses were there and they gave her painkillers. Um, and that was assisting her as she died. And it was what we should do, we should help people. But this is not assisting people when they're dying. It's giving them something that makes them die. And that is the difference. Um, and uh, I think it's very tragic. And uh, I, I think it's, uh, it, it's, it's spreading and you have, People just, you know, they, at a time when uh, something like suicide is a terrible burden, why do we encourage this? It's sad. So as you have left your role now as Archbishop for the city of Toronto, you will not be quite so engaged on those front lines of those social mm -hmm. issues that, are, that you have, you've been to Ottawa, you've been to the Supreme Court, you've done many things alongside, of course, the daily mass, all of those important uh, roles. But now you sit at a different role as Cardinal. And yeah. I, I am fascinated that you love to teach Lectio Divina. You, yes. you love to make that a public part of how mm -hmm. you are going to serve as you are now in year 51 of being a priest. 
I'll try to continue that once I get settled in my time of retirement. I'm not retiring from the priesthood or being a bishop or whatever. I'm just retiring from the administration, the responsibility of shepherding the Archdiocese of Toronto, the pastoral care of the Archdiocese of Toronto. That's now in the very, very good hands of Archbishop Leo. So I can step back, but I, I'm still... I will still celebrate Mass, I hear confessions, I um, go out and be teaching, I'll be doing, and I'm, I'm uh, be on the board of the Canadian Bible Society, and and I've, I'd, I'd like to find a way of continuing Lectio Divina. Um, it's uh, it's an ancient tradition of the Church, and normally it's done individually. People, it's, it's the thing goes right back to the Fathers of the Church, where you read the Scriptures, you meditate upon them, a little quiet prayer, read them again aloud, uh, and let it let the whole person experience it, but it is sometimes done in public, and that's what I did. It's right back to 2000 when I was at Edmonton. Uh, I would uh, we'd have le- uh, vespers, which is the uh, evening prayer of the church, in a very solemn way. Then I would just come out, take out a Bible. I usually I have my little Bible here. I, I have a little red Bible because I always say the Bible should be red. So I can't get over my little punny type thing. So anyway, I pull it out and then I would just read the whole text, maybe about 10, 15 verses, read it aloud, read it again, think about it, meditate upon it, and then read it again. And it's, and then end with a prayer. It's Lectio Divina is not Bible study. It is prayer. And it's using the, the hearing, speaking, meditating, reflecting, and then letting it touch the heart. It's an encounter with Christ uh, in the reading of the Word of God, encountering the Word of God when we read the Word of God. And uh, that uh, tradition goes way back to the early monks and even you know, earlier, I'm sure. So I'm, I've been trying to find ways of encouraging people, and the hope would be, like I would do this publicly in the cathedral, both at Edmonton and here, and it'd be live streamed, it'd be put on uh, salt and light at it and various things. But the hope would be that people then every day, when they're alone in themselves, they would take a Bible and and do that same kind of praying of the scriptures. Uh, and uh, I try to do it myself. You know, I, uh, I follow the, uh, I've been very much influenced since I was a teenager in, by the writings of Bishop Fulton Sheen. And he recommended for priests, he's very close to a church all the time by definition, but for others too, to spend an hour every day in adoration before the Blessed Sacrament, before the Holy Eucharist, and that reflecting, meditating upon the presence of the Lord sacramentally, and when, when doing that, read the Bible. And uh, so uh, I think that's good. Um, I remember reading a book by a Russian Orthodox bishop, Anthony Bloom, called Beginning to Pray. And I used to hand out this little book to my seminarians when I was a seminary uh, spiritual director. And he has this thing about, you get a little timer, you stick it off to the side, you forget about time, just let it go. And then a silent one. And then um, read the word of God. And then when it goes off, usually I do about 30 30 minutes, set it for 30 minutes. Read the word of God, not even think about time. Let it become timeless. And then when you hear ding, okay, then... Say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy me, a sinner. And then at the end of the public lecture divina, I would say the Our Father, the Hail Mary, the Glory Be, and the sign of the cross, the Blessed Trinity. And that would be it. So it's very simple. And this is not a patented system. I mean, they're dozens of different ways of doing this. This is just the way I've been doing it publicly and with the whole people will do it privately. And it begins with speak, Lord, your servant is listening. It's not let me understand or study or master the text. It's to be disposed to the presence of God and to encounter the Lord in the word of God and let uh, all the things be dispersed. Uh, I think as Origen said, let clear the stones out of the way so that there may be a pathway to my heart and let that be cleared away and then the Lord will come and visit me. I really like your challenge to allow the stones in the pathway to our heart 
to be moved out of the way. And for you, that practice happens well in Lectio Divina. What, if, if someone's listening, what scripture would you guide them to? What, what should they choose? Do you just open your red Bible? Well, there are many different uh, approaches to what to read when you're reading scripture uh, and all kinds of Bible plans that would be there. One thing I've been encouraging, especially since I discovered, sadly, at one of the gatherings of the Catholic School Board, actually, that the people had not, they didn't recognize when a parent was referring to what Jesus said. <laughs> they didn't realize it was from the gospel. That um, people say, oh, Jesus says this, Jesus says that. But they, they don't read the gospel. And so the real one, the actual Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John gospel. So what I have encouraged people to do lately is every day read one chapter of the gospel. Maybe read it aloud. Maybe read it quietly. Don't rush. Just take it that way. And so what I try to do in my time of prayer, I do a read one chapter of the gospel. It's also been encouraged since the book of Proverbs has 31 chapters. Uh, you might take the one for the day. Uh, and whatever the number of the day is, read that chapter of Proverbs. It's a bit of wisdom is always, they all use wisdom. And so that's a healthy thing. I've tried reading a bit of the Old Testament, a bit of the New Testament, a gospel, but it gets a bit complicated. So what I've found to be more helpful is to read a chapter of the gospel and then uh, to read one book for about 30 minutes. Uh, you know, one, just keep on going slowly, not rushing to get near to the end of it, letting it go. And then when it is finished, read another, maybe go from Old Testament to New Testament or, or something like that. Right now I'm trying to read the letters of Paul in that way. Uh, and just let them sink in and say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Another way uh, within the, the Catholic Church, we have every day, most of the Mass is made up. The first half is the word, liturgy of the Word. You get these little booklets, or you can get, uh, um, it's, on, it's also on uh, like cell phones. You can get apps. Uh, and uh, to read the um, reading, the first reading is usually in daily masses from somewhere in the Old Testament or New Testament. There's always a psalm and there's always a gospel. On Sunday, there's an Old Testament reading, a psalm, a New Testament reading, Paul usually, and then a gospel. And uh, it goes through the course of three years, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then during Easter time and other times it's John. So what I would encourage people to do is to go to Mass every day if they can, but many, many people do, and many can't, however. But at least read the Mass readings of the day. You get a little missalette, or you can get, a, um, you can get it on a, on a cell phone. The way that a very beautiful way of reading the praying the word of God, which I, I've been doing for, oh, 55 to 60 years now, ever since I was just beginning as a seminarian preparing for the priesthood, is the divine office. Now, I don't have it with me, it's upstairs. So I have a, what's called a breviary, and it's mostly Psalms, basically. Uh, but the good thing is you can uh, you can get it, you know, there's a thing called Universalis, an app called Universalis, U-N-I-V-E-R-S-A-L-I-S, or iBrevery, just I-B-R-E-V-I-A-R-Y. I have both of them on here. And it's very easy. You just flip open to it and you pray. There's morning prayer, midday prayer, evening prayer, and just before you go to bed, night prayer. And um, then there's the Office of Readings, which I usually do early in the morning. I do the Office of Readings of Morning Prayer. You start off with Psalm 95. You know, come ring on our joy to the Lord, let us hail the rock who saves us. Let us come before him giving thanks. What I do, I have to put eye drops in my eyes every day. Uh, just as you get old, you have these things. And you're supposed to let them settle for a while. So what I do is I put my go boop, boop the two drops in and then I pray Psalm 95 and a few other prayers the Angelus and things like that and then I begin the bravery um, the uh, liturgy of the word the liturgy of uh, the hours 
And so basically, uh, the, the Office of Readings is three psalms, a little hymn, three psalms, a passage, maybe a page or two of scripture, and then some of the spiritual readings of the church. The morning prayer is a little hymn, three psalms, a short scripture reading, and then the uh, Benedictus, the prayer, Canticle of Zechariah, then a few more prayers, the Our Father, and a closing prayer. Midday prayer is one psalm, short thing, quick. You can do it in the middle of the day, whip it out uh, in a break. And it's one psalm, a little short reading, a little prayer. And then evening prayer is a little hymn, three psalms, um, and then a bit of scripture, a little paragraph of the word of God, and then some more prayers, and then the Magnificat, my soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. And, and then a few more prayers, the Our Father. And then at the end, before you flick out the light, go to bed, the Compline or night prayer is the examination of conscience. Lord, forgive me for what I've done wrong today. Help me to serve you better tomorrow. Asking God's mercy, thanking God for his graces in the day. A little prayer. I usually use uh, uh, the uh, lead kindly light of the encircling gloom. Lead thou me on the night. And the thing from John Henry Newman. Then there's one little song and then a little scripture reading. And then now dismiss your servant of peace, the canticle of Simeon. And then we end off with a prayer to Our Lady and then flick out the light and go to bed. So that's a whole pattern of the Bible throughout the course of the day. Um, it, 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 officer readings, morning prayer, midday prayer, evening prayer, night prayer, then to bed. And that's what we will lace our lives with the Psalms. And um, for the priests promised to do this. They pray the office, we call it our mission of prayer, uh, when we're ordained. We promise to pray it for the people we serve. Uh, and we find that we, we encounter the Lord in the Psalms. And I always say to people, here I'm in an office in the rectory, the people you meet in the office are struggling with their cares. You meet in the divine office from my God, my God, why have you forsaken me to come ring out our joy to the Lord. The whole of life goes through in the Psalms. So I, I find that that is a very beautiful way to pray. Pausing the conversation for a moment to tell you about the Bible course, because whether you're a seasoned Bible reader or you're just getting started on your journey, the Bible course offers a superb overview of the world's best-selling book. This eight session course will help you grow in your understanding of the Bible. It uses a unique storyline and the Bible course shows you how key events, books and characters all fit together. It's great for in-person groups or it can be used for digital gatherings. You can use it anywhere you like. Watch the first session for free and review the accompanying course guide. Go to biblecourse.ca to learn more. That's biblecourse.ca. And as always, the link for this and all the information about our guest today will be down in the show notes. That is a remarkable daily discipline that mm -hmm. you as a priest bring on behalf of your congregation. But you've just yes. encouraged us. You as a lay person should enjoy this experience. Oh, yes. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. Um, Priests promise to pray it as the office of prayer for the people we serve. That much scripture over people. You promise to pray scripture over us as your people. Amazing. Exactly. That's what we do when we're ordained a deacon, actually. I, I promise on May 14th, 1972, kneeling in front of Bishop Paul Redding in St. Eugene's Church in Hamilton, I promise that for the rest of my life, I would pray for the people I serve. And it's the divine office. Like, again, my breviary is upstairs, but uh, it's a four volume thing, you know, one volume. But the easiest thing, you can get it on your phone. I mean, I, I must say, though there are beautiful leather breviaries, a breviary is just a, a brief <laughs> book, a book. Yeah, I think I, I'd say probably 90% of priests and bishops, maybe even the Pope, for all we know, pray it on, a, on an app. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's good to in a dark church. You know, you can look like this. And the other good thing about it, as you get older, your eyes are not so good. And you can get a big, I have a big breviary too, and a little one. But, you know, big print, but it's lugging it around. Well, when I'm going, I'm on the road anytime, I can just make the print bigger. It's great. You know, it's like the Holy, it's like the Holy Spirit knew we would need in this generation the, uh, 
the, the, the convenience of being able to reach into his word here on our phones. Uh, that, well, that's, that's a remarkable challenge to be so Bible focused in your prayer. And, and this is daily. Uh, how, how, yeah. how would you advise those of us who are lay people? who say, you know, what, I, I'm not exactly, you, you want us to pick up an app, pick up a, a Lectio Divina practice for mm-hmm. ourselves as well. Is that right? Oh, yes. Yes. Um, I, like, for example, I would say uh, any amount of time, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever, just to pray, read the Bible every day. That's a, that's a good thing. Maybe also not so much time, but read a chapter of the gospel every day. But when it comes to the Psalms, um, again, priests and deacons and so on promise to pray it for the people they serve. That's why it's their office, their mission of prayer. But it's called Liturgy of the Hours and Christian Prayer. It's also preferably done together. And sometimes uh, when two people are together, they pray it back and forth. And at and monasteries, I go to a monastery sometimes, they get away for a retreat. The monks pray it back and forth. You know, they do it at two in the morning, but I mean, you don't have to do that. <laughs> they control time where the rest of us don't. Um, but I think it's just a beautiful thing. And many lay people, many, many lay people pray, um, I wish I could hold my bravery, the divine office. And, and you can, you don't have to do the whole thing. I mean, uh, there's three midday prayers, mid-morning, midday, mid afternoon. You can do you know, whatever. But to pray morning prayer and evening prayer and maybe night prayer is wonderful. And you think of the Psalms, they, the Psalms that we like, the Psalms that are fit where we're at. If I'm happy, you know, come bring out our joy to the Lord. I'm sad, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So they fit where we are, but sometimes they don't. And if you're praying them, not my favorite Psalm all the time, the Good Shepherd Psalm every day, but rather if you pray them systematically, morning prayer, midday prayer, evening prayer, morning prayer, midday, you, you get to eat what's on your plate. It's good for you. It's not just only eating the, you know, the chocolates and the dessert and the apple pie. You, you eat, and so suddenly you're feeling great. And you flip open the next page of the divine office is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You think, well, I don't feel like that. I'm feeling great right now. But somewhere someone else is feeling that way. And maybe I pray this psalm not for myself, but for someone else. And I can enter into their experience. Or conversely, if I'm feeling, oh, this is a terrible day and I'm, oh, I'm so distraught, everything's going wrong, I flip open the page and it's, you know, come ring out our joy to the Lord, serve the Lord with gladness. Oh, and I think, well, I don't feel that way, but maybe someone else does and maybe I need to get out of my own self. We implode into ourselves too much. Maybe I should pray for someone else and not just for myself. So we lose ourselves in the Psalms and they're better. It's nice when the Psalm expresses what I feel. It's better when it doesn't because then it stretches me out of my own ego. And that's what we need to do. All right. I still want to push back a bit because there you are as, as a, as a, a cardinal, you've got that structured in your day as a loving priest a leadership figure, you must look at the busy beehive of how people run their lives, you know, kids being taken to hockey and Mm -hmm. all of those other things. What do you think we're missing when we skip the daily office of prayer through scripture? Mm -hmm. Well, I think we're, we're spinning faster and faster, but the faster the wheel spins, the more the hub has to be secure. And if it isn't, we go and we go off the. I remember once <laughs> I was once in a car when I was a university student. I was going over to University of Waterloo, and we were going zipping along the highway at a great speed. Then we came to a slow street near Waterloo, and the the car tilted sideways. The wheel fell off. I'm glad it happened when we were going slowly, not fast. But that's when the wheel falls off. Um, our life. If you are somebody once told me, if you're too busy to pray, you're too busy. And somebody else once said, Bishop Sheen, I think, said for a priest who uh, was busy serving the Lord and all that, like bishops are running around doing this or that, and saying, oh, Bishop, and he recommended a holy hour, which is one hour every day kneeling before the Holy Eucharist in the tabernacle as a 
place of sublime place of prayer, but it could be anywhere, you know, but that's our tradition. And so, oh, I'm too busy serving the Lord. I, I don't have time for an hour of prayer every day. And he said, well, if a priest doesn't have time for an hour every day, I understand, then spend two hours. So, you know, it's, we spend time in front of the television, you know, click, click, click. We, so, but it does mean though, like monks in monasteries control time. They have 2.30 in the morning, six in the morning. We don't, bishops don't, parents don't. I mean, we don't, you can't say, sorry, I can't care for the kids. I'm too busy praying. You know, you don't want to do that. That's, that's, that's crazy. So there's a slippage. There has to be a flexibility in according to our circumstances. You can't expect, there's a great book by one of my heroes, St. Francis de Sales, called An Introduction to the Devout Life. Devout doesn't mean just pious, it means focused. An introduction to the focused life, focus on Christ. He said, you can't expect a bishop or a parent to pray like a monk, you know, do exactly the same, or, or a monk to pray like, you know, each has our own circumstance. But we do need to pray. And we need to uh, be flexible, but you do need to pray somehow. And I think people who are busy need to pray more than monks need to pray. You know, they're busy too, and they're doing their mission, praying for us all. So I, I would say the times that we are most frantic and running around, the more we need to reflect. And if not, we're gonna spin, 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 and we're, you know, and also what it does, we pull off, Take get refreshed, like it's going down the 401. You know, you pull off, you get a, you know, have a coffee, you get a refreshment. Used to be you look at the map, you can kind of see where you're going, and then go back on. It's it's worse to be going fast down the wrong road than to be stopped on the right road. And we need to have regular times during the day when we stop, look, and listen. So that we, you know, the, the, it's there's a short form of this, by the way. I can just share it in the Catholic tradition called the Angelus. You may have seen a picture from France of a man and a woman in a field stopping to pray. And in the distance, you see a tower, a church tower. That's ringing the Angelus, bong, bong, the bell. And so what it, what it is, is three times a day, I, I usually do it, well, I pray the Angelus when I'm putting my drops in. It's... It's all out of scripture. The angel of the Lord declared unto Mary, and she conceived the Holy Spirit. Angel was done. That's, think of the gift of God, the initiative of God. And then Mary's response, behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it done unto me according to your word. That's how we should respond when God comes into our life. And then when we do that, the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And then we say, Poor, you know, pray for us, the Holy Mother of God, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. And the final prayer is, pour forth, we beseech you, O Lord, your grace into our hearts, that we to whom the incarnation of Christ, thy Son, was made known by the message of an angel, may by his passion and cross be brought to the glory of his resurrection. Amen. Very short. And after each of the things we say, the Hail Mary, which is basically the Gospel of Luke. So it's all biblical, <laughs> it's all. and it's that is done. I remember when I was in Archbishop of Edmonton, there's a young man from Holland who's now a priest over there. His bishop had suggested people come together and pray the Angelus three times a day. So we would ring a little bell and everyone is going to go into the chapel. We do the angel of the Lord. And then you do the Hail Mary, you know, Hail Mary full of grace. The Lord is with thee. That's the angel, it's Gabriel, uh, you know. Uh, blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. That's Elizabeth. You have the Annunciation, the angel announcing the message of God, then the visitation. You don't just stand there, you go and help. Mary helped Elizabeth. You know, and then Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, which we're all sinners now, and at the hour of our death. Amen. The only times that count now, the hour of our death. That's all there is. So these are all biblical things which are we can weave into our day. It doesn't take more than a second, a second or two, and nobody will know we're doing it. I can hear your passion that we pray with Scripture. 
not just daily. You, you'd like me to do it three times a day with scripture. Beautiful, beautiful mm-hmm. example. You, you have studied scripture. You have, your academic journey has been fascinating. And I, I, I don't want to switch over to a downer here, but you mm-hmm. have studied the apocalypse. It's a part of scripture oh, yes. Yes. we don't talk about very much, but it does, mm-hmm. does make for fascinating thought the apocalypse. What do you think is going to happen to this world? Well, I think we will have uh, uh, sin and repentance, redemption. We'll have the struggle of the human condition. But the apocalypse is not mainly about predicting what's going to happen to this world. The apocalypse is an experience of the glory of God in the midst of suffering. And it comes from a time of persecution, as does the other apocalypses like Daniel and other books of persecution. Look at read the books of Maccabees to get the background. So the apocalypse, when I was, I had finished my first study of scripture in 1984, and I was told by my bishop that I was to do a doctorate. So what should I study? It was around 1984 then. And I thought, well, coming up to the year 2000, people will be all worried about the end of the world and everything. So maybe I should understand what the apocalypse is about. So I spent two years in Rome studying the last 16 verses and my doctorate was on Apocalypse chapter 22, verses 6 to 21, as the focal point of moral teaching and exhortation in the Apocalypse. It's all the different threads come together there in that final section of the Bible, really, of the, of the Apocalypse. And I think what it tells us, it speaks to people in persecution. Uh, they were being persecuted. You think of the, you know, the lions and the forum, you know, in the the Colosseum and everything. Many of our brothers and sisters are being persecuted. I just heard there's another priest that's been kidnapped in Nigeria. Uh, We had uh, at Pentecost last year, a whole parish was massacred. Uh, And then we had the explosions uh, at the first communion that people had in uh, Sri Lanka two years ago. I mean, many Christians are being persecuted around the world. That's the world of the apocalypse. And if someone comes at you, claiming some worldly power or whatever, or you think of those saintly uh, 22 young men on the beach being being murdered, and they're told to renounce their faith, and they said, Jesus is Lord, including one of them who was not baptized, who said, their God is my God, and he became a saint. Became, he was just, he gave his life to Christ. Um, that's the world of the apocalypse. It's It's the world of the beast, which many of our brothers and sisters are facing. But there's another world, which is also in the apocalypse. Most of the Christians of the time of the apocalypse were not going to be thrown to the lions somewhere. There's a guy, Michael Antipas, for example, we hear in the first, the letters. But most were not. Most were going to be absorbed, sucked in by Babylon the Great. They were going to, their, their danger was not that they would deny Christ under torture, and they'd be forced to choose Jesus as Lord, not Caesar as Lord. That was not their danger. The danger was that they would deny Christ because they were being sucked in by a wealthy, godless society, a materialistic society where people are treated like things, like in the center of the apocalypse, people being bought and sold in the marketplace you know, the, the, you know, gold and silver, that's our society. Whereas many of our brothers and sisters are facing death for Christ, we are facing how to live in the midst of a corrupt materialistic society where I always say the only song in hell is I did it my way. And that's the sense of autonomy. My body, my life, it's mine. I can do what I want. That's not a healthy approach. And that's the danger we face. And that was faced in the time of the apocalypse as well. So I think the book of of Apocalypse allows us to break through and to see Christ in glory, as you do at the very beginning. There with the, you know, the the Lord, the vision of the Lord. John was on the island of Patmos facing persecution, but also corruption and absorption. He has a vision of Christ. And then he sees the whole of life in the context of the glory of the Lord. That's the apocalypse. Things about when is the end of the world going to come or 
uh, what's going to happen in the war here or there, or who's going to win the next election, or what does the Bible say about politics? Zero. I mean, that's not what it's about. It's not prediction. It's application of a vision of the glory of God. Cardinal Thomas Collins, we're going to have to leave it right there. But what a wonderful way to conclude. You've told us both personally and in our world around us how to live as people who are followers of Jesus. Thank you for serving on the board of directors for the Canadian Bible Society, a new role for you. Uh, thank you for teaching us to stay in the daily office of visiting scripture, whether through the practice of Lectio Divina, through apps uh, and applications online like this one or others. Thank you. It's been wonderful to visit with you today at Scripture Untangled. Well, thanks, Lauren. It's great to be here.